There's something you may not think about in your everyday life, but that almost all of us use. That topic is numerical weather prediction, and it's something uh, my colleague and I, Colm Clancy, are going to speak about today. My name is Alan Halley, and I'm a research meteorologist in the Climate Services Research and Applications Division at MetAaron. Hello, I'm Colm Clancy, a former college mate of Alan's, also working in the same division in MetAaron. So we both work in the area of numerical weather prediction, or NWP. So numerical weather prediction is the field where we um, produce weather forecasts through um, com uh, large computer simulations. So fundamentally, we take the laws governing the flow of the atmosphere. So these are classical physical laws. We express them in mathematical equations, and then we solve these equations using high performance supercomputers. So we do this four times a day at Mejeren to produce two day forecasts. And in fact, every time we do this, we don't just produce a single forecast, we produce a multiple forecast in what's known as an ensemble prediction system. So this is something that Alan knows a lot more about, so we'll let him explain this. So the general idea about ensemble prediction systems is to take account of what some of you may have heard of, um, the butterfly effect. So the butterfly effect in its essence really uh, describes chaos or chaos theory. So again, to describe that a little bit further, we're trying to represent all of the little uncertainties that exist uh, in our atmosphere and on our planet when we're doing uh, a numerical weather simulation. And so for that reason, uh, it's best practice and is international gold standard to run several uh, simulations of your uh, weather model and not just one. That way you can get a kind of uh, um, a handle on the uncertainty in the atmosphere and you might get a probabilistic output. So you will often hear this talked about uh, in the US where they talk about a percentage chance of rain and they get that information by running the model a, a number of times and calculating the percentage. Um, but we, we we need, as Colm says, really uh, incredibly powerful supercomputers when we're doing these simulations. Uh, and Colm will tell us a little bit more about those, those computers. Indeed. So in fact, the first uh, computer weather forecast was carried out in 1950 at Princeton in the US on a computer called the ENIAC. So the ENIAC filled an entire office and it managed to produce a 24 hour forecast, but very slowly. And in 2008, Peter Lynch at UCD showed that a pocket Nokia could in fact reproduce this forecast in a fraction of the time. So computing power has really come on a long, a long way since then, and numerical weather prediction has been at the forefront of this. So at MetAaron, uh, most of our operations are carried out on a supercomputer at the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecasting in Reading in the UK. Now, currently, this machine is roughly the 60th most important, most powerful machine in the world. And in fact, this is due an upgrade in the coming years. So really, we use a lot of computing power and meteorology is at the forefront of, the, of high performance computing. One of the reasons for this is the huge data volumes we use, and not least just the observations that are ingested into a model to kick off our forecasts. So for example, each time we run a forecast, we will use observations from surface stations, from balloon launches, from radar, from satellites, from um, various other sources such as ships, aircraft. And interestingly, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, because there's been so few aircrafts, the volume of um, observations available from this source has dramatically reduced. Um, thankfully, there hasn't been any major impacts on the forecast quality because we've been able to compensate with other sources, such as more satellites and increased um, balloon launches. So as I said, huge volumes of data are involved and I'll hand you back to Alan now to say a bit more about this. Yeah, the, the data volumes are really incredible that we're talking about. So when, when we run our numerical model, as, as we introduced earlier uh, each day, uh, we actually produce uh, upwards of um, three or 400, 500 gigabytes each time we, we, we do that. Um, so we're talking about hundreds of, pet of ter terabytes uh, per year. Um, so if you think about how much your, your mobile phone can, can store these days, it's usually around 32 gigabytes uh, or 64 gigabytes it can store. So um, 
we would require a lot of mobile phones to, to take care of all of the information that we produce from our numerical weather forecasts. Um, what kind of do we do with this data then? So everyone will have heard of artificial intelligence or machine learning. So having all of these, uh, this data available to us allows us to use these techniques uh, like artificial intelligence to try and improve the forecasts um, and one example is, is our geolocation forecast that you'll have seen on our app and on our website, uh, and that uses uh, some um, machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, but there are also a lot of other everyday uses of um, the numerical weather prediction data. Uh, and Colm, you're going to tell us a bit about some of those? Sure. Well, ultimately, one of the biggest concerns for MedAaron is the use of weather prediction for public safety. So just a few days ago, we had warnings out for Storm Aiden. So th this is a core part of our operations to warn the public of potentially hazardous situations. Um, so we're able to brief emergency services, et cetera. Weather forecasting also in, is, has a huge um, impact in the aviation sector, of course, because airplanes can't take off or land without proper knowledge of the weather conditions, both observed and predicted at an, at an airfield. Um, of course, there are lots of day-to-day -day uses. If you're into surfing, if you're into um, you know, sailing, canoeing, anything like that, you'll want to know what the weather is like. Um, so really, often, when, when we think of things like that, it's, it's not so much, not necessarily in any absolute sense what the weather is like, but we're more interested often in what's the weather going to do to us? What impact will it have on us? So, uh, you know, a yellow level warning, okay, that mightn't bother me if I'm just walking to work. Um, but if my work involves me um, putting uh, tiles on a roof, then, you know, a weather warning might have a huge impact. So this is a huge area that's um, growing um, in the field of meteorology called impact-based forecasting. And Alan knows a lot more about this. So back to you, Alan. Thanks, Colm. Yeah, no, you introduced it nicely already. Those examples are very good. It's it's it, it's it kind of sounds like a cop-out when I will say it, but it's more about telling people what the weather will do rather than describing the numerical values associated to to a strength of wind for example um, because it's a, a lot easier for people to picture um, that if there's a strong wind it might impact their job as you've already said or it might impact their their hike in the countryside or the surfing conditions that they're they're, they're hoping to enjoy uh, rather than telling them that the wind will be 50 or 60 kilometers an hour and at the back of all of this as well is is kind of it's 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 more global approach to forecasting so we're, we're, we're hoping to move to this type of forecasting in the context of, of our changing climate and also in the, in terms of population expansion so there's going to be more and more people living in in, in areas uh, particularly uh, exposed to high impact or dangerous weather phenomena so it, it it kind of makes sense to to try and warn these people of the impacts of, of those um weather phenomena um and we kind of hope from from this video today that perhaps the next time that you you're you're, you're on a plane or you're taking a walk uh, uh, in the countryside, you'll think about uh, numerical weather prediction. The observations from that aircraft have they helped make the forecast better? Um, if you're taking your walk by the countryside, what are the impacts of the wind on your walk? Um, and overall, we hope that we have tried explained a little bit at least. Uh, about the world of numerical weather prediction.